Today, as we come to the table, Paul was able to say later on, this light affliction that we go through in this world is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory that waits on us. And when you think about Paul saying his light affliction, Paul literally spent years in prison, years of his life taken away. Right now, two years of Paul's life had just been as far as his mind could see, just removed and taken away. All the shipwrecks in the ocean and all these things that happened to Paul, the beatings, Paul said every bit of it's worth it because he understood the mindset of eternity. We've got to get the eternal mindset and not just the temporary mindset, and especially when it comes to the enduring trials. Listen, if you don't have the eternal mindset when it comes to an enduring trial, you're never going to make it. When you think about the really difficult seasons in your life, how easy is it for you to say those troubles were light and momentary? Pastor Mark shows us from the life of Paul today that even though the trials can be huge and lasting, there's still nothing compared to the glory God has waiting for you. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville. When you consider eternity, an eternity spent with God, an eternity void of pain or suffering, You gain a new perspective on the trials faced here on earth. Nothing that you face here amounts to anything when you put it into the perspective of eternity. Like Paul says, it's all light and momentary. Now let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Acts chapter 25 as he begins his message, The Enduring Trial. Let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 25. As we continue on in the the middle of this journey of Paul and the story of Paul and the trials of Paul and and make the application to our own lives as well. But Acts chapter 25, let's pray as you guys are turning there and ask God just to really open his word to us today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. And Lord, again, as we open up your word, we need you to open up our hearts and we need you to open up our ears. God, every time we come to your word, we need your help in understanding it. You tell us that your word is spiritually discerned. It is not discerned by the normal reading of, of a book or someone who doesn't know you. It is something the spirit does. You activate our spiritual senses to be able to understand. And I ask you to do that this morning. But we've come to hear from you. We've gathered, Lord, to seek your face. And through what you're doing in our lives this morning, God... Lord, you're going to speak to us from your word. And through what you did in Paul's life or in Caesarea and the trials that he went through, the enduring trials that Paul faced, God, some of us are facing enduring trials this morning. And I pray for the encouragement of all of your believers here this morning that are in the midst of an enduring trial. Lord, not that I belittle the normal trials of life, but the enduring trials are the most difficult, the ones that never seem to end. And oftentimes there seems to be no end in sight. But Lord, there is. And in these deep and enduring trials, you're doing a greater work than we could ever dream or imagine. God, encourage us this morning. Encourage your people this morning. And Lord, just minister. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The enduring trials. Uh, where we last left off with Paul, last week, if you guys remember, Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea by Felix the governor, who had been removed by Nero due to misconduct. And now it's two years later. So understand when you're reading the Bible, sometimes when you're reading through, A long time can pass from one chapter to another. This is one of those times. We're jumping two years now from the time that Paul was first put in prison and Felix was there as the governor. Now Festus is taking over. He's going to be the new governor. And it's two years down the road with Paul in this trial that he's in, quite literally a trial, quite literally prison. But he's wrongfully in prison. And when this new governor comes on the scene, and that really, I think, comes to bear in what was in my heart about what I feel God is speaking this morning to us, and that is enduring trials. Paul's in the midst of an enduring trial. That is something that doesn't just come and pass. Now, you know the trials that come and pass. They come and it doesn't matter how short they are. If it's a hard trial, they seem difficult. But typically trials will come and go and we see a month, a few months go by and all of a sudden we're out of the trial and then God gives us a break and then maybe we're entering into another trial that lasts or whatever. And that's very normal to have these trials that last 
whatever God is doing and the trial we need to go through. But listen to me, there are going to be trials that you guys go through and that I go through and that we go through that sometimes last for years. And I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm not trying to get you to think, oh no, I'm in one of those that I'm never going to get out. No, here's what I'm saying. Even in the midst of an enduring trial, God gives grace. Even in the midst of an enduring trial, you're in the midst of battle, you get some R&R, you get some stateside, so to speak. So it doesn't mean that you're going to be in this constant heavy weight of pressure all the time, not able to endure. But what it does mean is this. Some of the trials you guys are in right now and some of the trials you're going to be in in the future, they're going to be trials of longevity. They're going to be trials of endurance. You know, I've got one of my girls running across country right now. You know, there are different styles. You got the, the sprinters and you got the endurance. I was really more of an endurance runner uh, back when I ran because I was medium fast, but I wasn't fast enough to really compete on any kind of competitive level at the sprinting. So if you're going to do anything to be competitive, it would need to be more of the long term running. And for me, it was more of just recreational, but still that endurance was there. And yet, although I didn't mind that that much when it came to the running field growing up, I don't like it when it comes to being a Christian. I like the sprinting better. In, in the physical world, I like the endurance and the longer run. In the spiritual realm, just let the gun go off, let me run, and just let me run across that tape and everybody collapse and breathe hard for a minute. And let's move on, okay? Be done with this thing. This is not always a sprint. Oftentimes, our trials are enduring and they're lasting. Paul's in the midst of one of these. And Paul has now been wrongfully imprisoned for two years. Now, imagine Paul's personality. It's one thing to be imprisoned for anyone. But if you're the type of outdoors person that needs to be on the go all the time, like Paul was, and somebody puts you in a small room and closes the door, that's a tough situation. And now Paul finds himself in this tough situation with this enduring trial. And there's something for Paul here to learn. And there's something for us to learn. And guys, understand this. There are things that God needs to do in our lives and not just in our lives, in the lives of the people around us. That sometimes an enduring trial is the only way to do it. And I don't like it any more than you guys like it. But one day it's all going to be worth it. And Paul was able to say later on, this light affliction that we go through in this world is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory that waits on us. And when you think about Paul saying his light affliction, Paul literally spent years in prison, years of his life taken away. Right now, two years of Paul's life had just been, as far as his mind could see, just removed and taken away. All the shipwrecks in the ocean and all these things that happened to Paul, the beatings, Paul said every bit of it's worth it because he understood the mindset of eternity. We've got to get the eternal mindset and not just the temporary mindset, and especially when it comes to the enduring trials. Listen, if you don't have the eternal mindset when it comes to an enduring trial, you're never going to make it because enduring trials take a long time. They do deep things. Sometimes there can seem like there's never an end in sight, but God has a reason, God has a purpose, and there is an end in sight. And oftentimes, I'm sure... Paul was thinking this, and we can think this as well. Lord, how long? How long is this going to last? And you know what? This isn't, we might even be thinking this morning, this isn't fair. And not only is it fair, it doesn't seem that anyone's helping me. Why is it that I'm in this thing? Why can't I get out of it? And why is no one helping me? And especially if you're kind of a, a fight or flight type personality, you know, for me, it's like, especially when I was younger, if I couldn't see a way out, I would just say, I'm just going to get out of here in one way or the other. Now, God's gotten me beyond that now in years of maturity But again, I can see Paul with all these struggles, being the kind of man that he was and knowing the struggles that I have. And Paul now finds himself in this very tough situation. And why would God do this to Paul? Why would God just, you know, have Paul sit there for two years and wait? Now, remember this. This is the thing. We tend to think, well, Paul, this just happened to him. He's in a tough situation and Paul's going to get over it. God doesn't waste a single day in our lives. Understand that. He doesn't waste a single day. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a reason that God does. So every day that God's put Paul in that prison at Caesarea. God was working in Paul. God was working in the people around Paul, you know, touching the lives of the prison keepers, touching the lives of the other prisoners. But also guys note this, and this is the thing, God was doing a neat and deep work in Paul for what God had planned for Paul's life. I mean, look at how God used Paul. God used Paul to write half of the New Testament. God was preparing Paul to stand before the leader of the known world, Emperor Nero. And if Paul's going to be standing before the leader of the known world and being a witness for Christ, if Paul's going to be writing half of the New Testament, I know the Lord wrote it, I understand that, we all are there on the same page, but God used Paul as the pen. He had to develop him in such a way he could be used as that instrument. If God was going to use Paul to plant churches all over the world, look what God had to do in Paul's life. And the problem is, the greater God's going to use you guys, the more trials you have to go through. 
And the greater God's going to use you guys, sometimes the more enduring trials and the deeper it will be. You might be thinking, you know what, how come other people seem to be just doing fine and I've got this deep chasm I can't get out of? Because God has something much deeper for you to do. And the bottom line is, is do you want to be used in great ways? You just kind of get through. Now, some of you might be saying, just let me get through. Let's get in heaven. Fine. If that's where you are, that's great. That's okay. Look wherever God has you, if that's what you want. But if you're desiring to be used for God in an eternal way that is much greater, I I believe with all my heart right now, for some of you guys that are going through enduring trials, and maybe some of you have been in these things for years right now, and you're going, you're right, I have been years in this trial. God is doing something so much deeper and so much greater than than you know. You're not going to know until you're in the kingdom. And that is not spiritual cheerleading. I see this all through the scripture. God has a purpose. He has a reason. And there's always the fruit at some point. Whether the fruit is down here or whether the fruit is eternal, God has a point. And God has the fruit that he's going to bring out. That's exactly what's happening here with Paul. Paul was being used for the Jews in that region. How? Everybody was talking about this Paul guy that was locked up in Caesarea that was causing so much trouble. Well, what did Paul do? What was Paul teaching? Ah, glad you asked. And God was able to use even the conversation about Paul to spread the gospel. All the governors of Rome, they had to talk about Paul and what he was accused of. Paul was always, no matter what was going on in his life, he was at the forefront of causing conversation. And the conversation revolved around what his message was and what his accusations were. And that is preaching some man who had risen from the dead by the name of Jesus Christ. And so you see what's going on in the world around Paul. You see what's going on in Paul. And the main thing I want you to understand is if you're in that enduring trial this morning, even temporary, but especially if you're suffering through an enduring trial, God is doing something deep in you, and he's doing something deep in the people around you. Nothing is wasted. Not a drop of what God does is wasted. One man put it this way. He said, no physician ever weighed out medicine to his patient with half so much care and exactness as God weighs out to us every trial. Not one grain too much does he ever permit to be put on the scale. That is amazing. And that is absolutely true. God doesn't allow anything to happen in our life that he doesn't have a reason for it happening. Look, if you love your kids and you know your kids have to go through something painful at the doctor's office or painful in a surgery or painful in life, don't tell me as a parent you're not right there limiting exactly how much pain they're going to have to go through. I know you are. You're watching. If they don't need that shot, they're not going to get that shot. You're going to stop that. I remember when Lieli, when she was born, she was kind of bony and little when she was born. And they always give them that shot, you know, on the heel and they do all this kind of stuff. It's always painful to see that and to go through that. And only what had to be done, what I let them do. And she was so just unsettled when she was first born and all that was going on. She looked so little and so bony and they wanted to give her that shot. And I stopped them. I still said, nope, you're not giving her that shot. Right now she can have it later. We'll give her a special K breakfast a little bit later. It's a special, it's a K shot, vitamin K to stop the blood or whatever. I said, we'll do that later. Right now you let her calm down. They let her calm down. Then they gave her the shot and she was able to scream all over again. But the bottom line is... As a parent, you care about every single thing they go through. You realize she's got to have that shot. I understand that. But I'm going to wait until she's able to handle that and ready to handle that. She's not going to have any more than she's going to have. I remember another one of them, uh, one time a dia, they were trying to get some uh, blood for some test or whatever, and she was tiny. And they couldn't find the vein. And this nurse is like just moving the needle everywhere trying to find this vein. This went on for like a long time. And finally, I just, stop it. You're not getting any blood. Not today, you know, unless it's from me. So pull the needle out. You're done. We'll get blood later and let my daughter calm down. I know as a father what that feels like to protect your kids and to not make them go through any more pain than they need. Now, with that said, Jesus said, I'm evil. What do you mean, Mark? Well, he he said, you, if you being evil, he was speaking to his disciples, he means by nature. By nature, we're sinful. I know we're not out trying to, you know, stomp on little toads or something, but the point is we're evil by nature. He says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father? So let me change that now. If Mark, your pastor, being evil by nature, will protect my child from undue pain that they don't need, how much more will a holy God in heaven protect you guys from any more pain than you need in your life? And that's the point that really needs to be understood when it comes to the trials you're facing. And especially the enduring trial that you're facing because God is doing oftentimes things through the trials that will blow your mind. When missionary Adoniram Judson was dying, news came to him that some Jews in Turkey, some Jews in Turkey now, had been converted through reading about his account of his sufferings in Burma. He had suffered greatly as a missionary in Burma. 
And he said, this just awes me and amazes me, he said to his wife. When I was a young man, I prayed for the Lord to send me to the Jews in Jerusalem as a missionary. But instead, he sent me to Burma to preach, and I suffered and was tortured in prison. Now, because of my sufferings, God has brought some of the Jews in Turkey to repentance. Who would have ever dreamed that by his suffering in Burma and spending time in jail, that God fulfilled the very thing that was in his heart to reach the Jewish people. And God did it to reach the Jews by the testimony that he wrote and that they read. See, you don't know what God's doing. You don't know how God's going to use it. You have no idea. Be faithful and trust in the Lord. God always works and he has a reason for the way that he's going to work. And sometimes we're in the midst of these trials or we have something going. We don't really see there's any good that can come out of it. Uh, and sometimes we feel a lot like this guy I read about this week. He said he went to his doctor and the doctor said to him, I have some bad news and some worse news for you. And so the patient said, well, let's have it. The doctor said, first, the bad news. That is you only have 24 hours to live. And the patient said, well, I can't imagine having any worse news than that. What's the worst news? He said, well, I forgot to tell you yesterday. <laughs> sometimes that's how we feel in the midst of our trials. We're simply going to die and that's it. And there's no hope. Let me tell you something. If you know the Lord, everything that's happening in your life has a reason. And we see some pretty bad suffering in this world, don't we? Some really bad suffering. Reading just this morning about apparently today, a a church that someone burst into in another country and they killed some 40 people just today because they were gathered together like this, worshiping God. They came and blew up bombs and just killed everybody there. Terrorists did it. We hear about that. We think, Lord, how could you use that? Listen, I don't know, but I know this. He will. He will use it for his glory. And and oftentimes, you know, it's been said that it's the blood of the saints that is the life of the church and the church throughout history. Not that we necessarily want to die, but God doesn't waste a drop. And now Paul's going to learn that God hasn't wasted a single drop in his life. Look at chapter 25, verse 1. Again, we take up the scene, remember, with Paul being in prison for two years. Felix is now going to be removed from chapter 24 to chapter 25. Festus, the new leader, is going to come in, the new governor of the region. Paul's still sitting in prison in Caesarea. The Jews still wanted to kill him. And it says, and when Festus had come to the province after three days... He went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So he's brand new there. He just gets in. Word comes, hey, the new governor's here. And the new governor goes three days later to Jerusalem. And no doubt Paul was probably thinking, great, we have a new governor. I have hope. Somebody else is here. Maybe he'll hear my case. Maybe he'll get me out of prison. And I don't know whether or not this was going through Paul's mind or not. But it was interesting to me here when it said after three days he went up to Jerusalem. I wonder if Paul didn't hear about that and maybe have some hope and think, you know, what else happened after three days? There was a resurrection. Maybe God's going to resurrect some hope for me getting out of prison. I've got a new governor. God is going to do something new. And I don't know what God was doing, but I know God was encouraging Paul. And so three days later, he goes up to Jerusalem. And then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him. Again, these guys hated Paul so much. I mean, two years go by. They're still trying their best to get this guy the death sentence. They want him killed because of the fact that he's preaching Jesus. They just hated him. And so they petitioned the brand-new governor, Festus. They get a chance to talk to him, no doubt, before Paul ever did or any other prisoner. And notice they were asking a favor of him that he would summon Paul to Jerusalem while they lay in wait along the road to kill him. Now, no doubt they didn't tell Festus that. They probably didn't say, Festus, why don't you have Paul come down here? We're going to lay in ambush and kill him. No, what it means is, look, could you bring Paul down here? And then they're discussing behind the scenes, look, on the way down, let's kill the guy. Let's see if we can talk Festus into bringing him down. No doubt he's not going to bring him down with all these Roman soldiers like they took him up with, because when they took him up there with these four to 500 soldiers, they were protecting him. They probably think there's no danger now. They'll bring him back with just a few soldiers on either side, have him handcuffed or whatever, you know, his his hands bound, and then we'll attack him and kill him. And so that was their plan. That's what they wanted to do. And again, it's the same old tricks they tried to pull two years ago. Remember when Paul's nephew heard about it, came in and told the, the commander, and they snuck him up there. And now they're trying to do the same thing. Let's just get him away from the Romans where we can kill him. Again, it shows the amount of hate that they had for the gospel and for Paul's boldness to share it. Look at verse 4. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. That was the right thing. You know, Festus knew that. Look, he's a a Roman prisoner. He needs to be in the Roman courts. Why do you guys want him to come here? This is the right thing. Leave him there. And, of course, God's intervening to protect Paul in all this. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. Now, it didn't matter the topography or which was higher In that region, Jerusalem was always considered the highest point mentally. That is, no matter where you came from, you always went up to Jerusalem. 
And whenever you left Jerusalem, you're always coming down from Jerusalem. So although Caesarea was a lot farther north and was actually up on the earth from Jerusalem, when you traveled up to Caesarea, they would say, we're going up to Caesarea. Now when Felix is coming down from Caesarea to Jerusalem, notice what he says. He says, you know, I'm going to come up to Jerusalem. Why don't you guys come down with me? And I think there's something very symbolic in that. And that is they were definitely coming down with Festus in order to falsely accuse Paul. And anytime you falsely accuse a brother or a sister in the Lord, you're coming down. You're coming down to a lower place. You're coming down to a place that is not where God would have us to be. And so they're all, I know, literally coming down, but also to me it's very symbolic here. If I says, why don't you come down with me and let's accuse him. And guys, remember that. We need to be careful when it comes to gossip and slander. Because whenever we're talking about a brother or sister or anyone else, we are most certainly coming down and we're bringing others down with us to bring false accusations. You know, as I get older and as I spend more time just living life, I'm becoming much more blunt and straightforward. Now, I hopefully still in grace and in love. I, everything needs to be done in grace and love. But I've learned over the years the hard way that oftentimes if you're too soft in your approach to someone that you need to approach, they never even get what you're talking about. And the situation never gets resolved. And yet if you're too hard and you're rude, then you tear them down. We've got to find that balance to say, you know what, we've got to talk. And you've got to be straightforward and just say, here's what the deal is. And then the chips fall where they may. Doing it in love and, uh, and there's nothing wrong in that. But when it comes to gossip and slander behind someone's back, if we're not directly addressing something, guys, it does damage. It brings us down and it brings others down as well. And so he says, come down with me. Let's accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. And when he had remained among them for more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. So now the scene is set. He has traveled to Jerusalem. He's gotten the leaders there that want Paul dead to come back to Caesarea with him. The court is now in session. The people are seated. He's on his, his judgment seat, and they call for Paul, and Paul now comes to stand before him somewhere there in one of the, the Roman governing areas of Caesarea. And when Paul had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about him and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. Now, this language here is interesting. It says they stood about him. Literally, in the language, it means they surrounded him. Now, no doubt they had him far enough back. There were Roman guards making sure these guys couldn't jump on him and kill him. But you get this whole scene of Paul comes in and all of his enemies just gather around. They're just like, well, we're ready to take you down, man. And they're all around him on all sides, you know, behind Paul just watching him. In front of him is a judge that doesn't know him and is not necessarily going to be friendly to him because he doesn't really care. And so Paul is surrounded in this situation. And Paul, again, like he always does, has to depend on the Lord. God is going to be faithful and God will always be faithful in these situations. But notice it says they laid many serious complaints. Interesting, the word serious comes with the meaning of severe or stern or violent or cruel or heavy. So they were coming up with all these accusations. Paul hadn't done anything wrong. And yet not only did they have accusations against Paul, they had heavy, they had heavy accusations, cruel accusations, vile accusations, violent, I should say, accusations, stern accusations, all this being brought against Paul. And Paul just standing there hearing all these lies and all these false accusations against him. And notice it says they could not prove any of them. Again, if you're innocent, God will show your innocence. But guys, understand this. When you make a stand for the Lord, especially the way Paul did, you're going to have some stern accusations against you. Sometimes you're going to have some heavy accusations against you. But if you are clean before God, no one can prove them. That's the key. While our time at the table of God's Word is ending for today, please keep reading in the book of Acts. From the inspiring faith of Stephen, to walking through Paul's conversion, to observing how the early church grew and thrived, there's much more to gain from this eventful book. Jesus had promised to send a helper, and he certainly delivered in sending his spirit to overflowing in these new Christians. It must have been an exciting and also very challenging period of time that these men and women were getting to be a part of. If there was something in this message that you need to hear again, you can go to thewaymedia.net and navigate to Come to the Table to Listen to or download this or other messages. You can also download the Way Media app so you know when new broadcasts are happening. 
If you're a prayer warrior, we very much value your consistent prayers during this study through Acts. God can do mighty things through the faithful prayers of those who seek after Him. We're earnestly expecting Him to do big things in and through this radio ministry. We're thankful for your prayers, and we're trusting God to use this platform to get the word out and for it to spread like wildfire. Pastor Mark has more to share through the book of Acts, so we hope you'll be able to join us next time. We look forward to what will be shared about these people of faith and the trials and triumphs they faced as they walk out their lives in a way that sought to honor God. May these accounts inspire you to do the same and to come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.